Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We move forward with our discussion of the Criminal Procedure Code and in this lecture we'll have a look at the classification of offences. So what are offences? Section 2N of the CRPC says that offence means any act or omission made punishable by any law for the time being in force. So an offence may be an act that is a commission, somebody has done something or omission that is not doing something. So an offence means an act or an omission made punishable by any law for the time being in force. So the important characteristic is it should be punishable by any law for the time being in force and includes any act in respect of which a complaint may be made under section 20 of the Cattle Trespass Act 1871. So any act of commission or omission that is made punishable by any law for the time being in force is an offence. Now we have seen before that crimes are not defined under any act but offence is defined under the CRPC. So what's the difference? Offence is the genus of which crime is a species. So offence is a much bigger set than crime. And all crimes are offences, but all offences are not crimes. So offence is the genus, it's the larger thing of which crime is a smaller part of it. So all crimes will come under the category of offences. So all crimes are acts of commission or omission that have been made punishable under law. But all offences need not be crimes. Because in the case of crime, you need to have actus reus and mens rea. So it is possible that you have certain offences that are not crimes if you do not have both the components. Now CRPC classifies offences into several categories. We have cognizable and non-cognizable offences. So we'll look at all of these in detail but what are the classifications? You can have cognizable offences where the police has the power to arrest without warrant and start an investigation. And non-cognizable offences where the police requires the permission of the court to begin the uh, investigation or to uh, arrest the offender. Then we have bailable and non-bailable offences. A bailable offence is one where bail is available as a matter of right. So if the person wants bail, he will be given bail. But in a non-bailable offence, bail is not available as a matter of right. So it is possible that in the case of a non-bailable offence, the person wants a bail, the accused wants the bail, but the court denies it. But it is also possible in the case of a non-bailable offence that the court gives bail to a particular person, a particular offender. So it's not that a non-bailable offence cannot be bailed. The only difference is that in the case of a non-bailable offence, the bail is not available as a matter of right. But in the case of a bailable offence, it's available as a matter of right to the offender. Then offence triable as summons case and offence triable as warrant case. So the CRPC makes this distinction. Some cases are known as summons case, some cases are known as warrant cases. And we'll look at their differences. Offence exclusively triable by a court of session and offence not exclusively triable by a court of session meaning that an offence which may be tried by a judicial magistrate or of competent jurisdiction. Now we have seen before that a court of sessions is the uh, topmost uh, criminal court in a district. So there are certain offences that are exclusively triable by a court of session, meaning that they cannot be tried by any other lower court. They have to go to the court of sessions. Only that has the power or jurisdiction to try those, those offences. And there are other offences that are not exclusively triable 
by a court of sessions meaning that they can be tried in lower courts as well so they may be tried in the court of a judicial magistrate of a competent jurisdiction then we have compoundable and non compoundable offenses compoundable offenses are those where a compromise may be reached non compoundable offenses are those offenses where a compromise may not be reached so let us look at all of these in more detail now cognizable and non cognizable offenses are defined in section 2 definitions of this rpc so section 2c says cognizable offense means an offense for which and cognizable case means a case in which a police officer may in accordance with the first schedule or under any law for the time being in force arrest without warrant so a cognizable offense is an offense and a cognizable case is a case and what are the characteristics these are those cases where a police officer may in accordance with the first schedule or under any law for the time being in force arrest without warrant so this is the important thing the police officer may arrest without warrant in accordance with the first schedule or any other law now what is the first schedule we have seen before that the first schedule classifies the offenses in the crpc so this is the first schedule it says in regard to offenses under the ipc the entries in the second and third columns against a section the number of which is given in the first column are not intended as definition so it is just saying that we are only referring to the sections we are not defining the offenses here they are referred to in the ipc but we are mentioning a short uh uh word about uh, the that particular section as an indication of the substance of the section so we cannot make use of the first schedule to say that okay this is an offense that is defined as such no for the definition you have to go back to the ipc and here we will only be referring to the sections of the ipc and in this schedule the expression magistrate of the first class and any magistrate include metropolitan magistrates but not executive magistrates and two the word cognizable stands for a police officer may arrest without warrant and the word non cognizable stands for a police officer shall not arrest without warrant so this is divided into two parts the first part is offenses under the ipc so this is how it looks like so part 1 offenses under the indian penal code so here it will it is telling you all the different sections for each section what is the offense now these are not the definition these are just an indication of what is written there then it says punishment and then whether it is cognizable or non cognizable then bailable or non bailable and by what court triable so for instance let us look at some of the more common offenses so for instance it says being a member of an unlawful assembly section 143 so it says the penalty here is imprisonment for 6 months or fine or both and this is a cognizable offense meaning that if somebody is a member of an unlawful assembly the police may arrest without warrant that particular offender then it says it is bailable meaning that the police can arrest without warrant but then if the person wants bail he will be given the bail bail is available as a matter of right and it can be tried by any magistrate whereas if we see writing armed with a deadly weapon section 148 then it says it can only be tried by a magistrate of the first class not any magistrate then if we look at these sections section 161 being or expecting to be a public servant and taking a gratification other than legal remuneration in respect of an official act so basically taking a bribe so it is imprisonment for 3 years or fine or both and this is cognizable so the police can arrest without warrant if a person being a public servant is taking an illegal gratification and this is non bailable 
meaning that in these cases bail is not available as a matter of right. It is up to the court to decide whether or not to give the bail and it has to be tried before the magistrate of the first class. In certain other cases, we will find this one, section uh, 194. So, it says giving or fabricating false evidence with intent to cause any person to be convicted of capital offence. Now, because this is a bigger offence, so it says the, uh, the penalty is imprisonment for life or rigorous imprisonment for 10 years and fine and this is a non bailable and it has to be tried in a court of session. It cannot be tried in one of the lower courts. So, this is what it is saying. Section 2C cognizable offence means an offence for which and a cognizable case means a case in which a police officer may in accordance with the first schedule. So, this is what we saw that is the first schedule or any other law for the time being in force arrest without warrant. And section 2L says non-cognizable offence means an offence for which and non-cognizable case means a case in which a police officer has no authority to arrest without warrant. So, the bigger offences like murder, kidnapping, decoity, etc. are cognizable offences while simple hurt, defamation, bigamy that is having two marriages, etc. are non-cognizable offences. And column number 4 of the first schedule to the CRPC will show whether a particular offence is cognizable or non-cognizable and this is what we saw here. Column number 4 of the first schedule tells whether a, an offence is cognizable or non-cognizable. Now, the first schedule has two parts. The first part is concerning the IPC offences and the second is concerning the non-IPC offences. So, here we were looking at the first part which is dealing with the IPC offences. But then if we go at the end of it, then we will find the second part as well. Here is the second part. So, the second part says classification of offences against any other law. So, these are the non-IPC offences. Before that, we were only looking at all these sections of the IPC, but because the CRPC is also applicable for other um, acts, so the part 2 is dealing with classification of offences against other laws. So, in the case of any other law, if it is not mentioned in the act per se about whether the case is cognizable or not, bailable or, or not and by what court it is triable then we will make use of part 2 of schedule 1. So, it says if punishable with death, imprisonment for life or imprisonment for more than 7 years. In that case, it is cognizable, non bailable and it has to be tried in a court of session. So, if you have any punishment more than 7 years or death or imprisonment for life, then it has to be tried in a court of session. If it is punishable with imprisonment for 3 years and upwards, but not more than 7 years. So, for a punishment between 3 and 7 years, it will be tried by a magistrate of the first class. And in both of these cases, so in the case of any offence, which is punishable by 3 years or more, it will be a cognizable offence, even if the act does not say anything about it. And in both of these cases, it will be a non bailable offence. So, anything with a punishment of 3 or more years is cognizable and non bailable. So, the police can arrest without warrant and right, bail is not available as a matter of right. Now, 3 to 7 years it will be tried by magistrate of the first class and 7 years or more will be tried by court of session. So, this is exclusively triable by a court of session. Now, for all other uh, offences, if the punishment is for imprisonment for less than 3 years or with fine only. So, in all of those cases, they are non-cognizable offences. So, the police cannot arrest without warrant. And even if there is an arrest, then these are bailable. So, bail is available as a matter of right. So, if the offender says, I want bail, he or she will be given bail. And they are triable by any magistrate. So, as the severity of the offence increases, 
as the punishment that is prescribed for the offense increases it becomes cognizable non bailable and tried by a higher court so this is what it is saying the first part uh, the first schedule has two parts the one concerning ipc offenses and the second concerning the non ipc offenses and this is how we make out whether a particular offense is cognizable or non cognizable then there are also other provisions for example section 155 of the crpc says information as to non cognizable cases and investigation in such cases when information is given to an officer in charge of a police station of the commission within the limits of such a station of a non cognizable offence he shall enter or cause to be entered the substance of the information in a book to be kept by such officer in such form as the state government may prescribe in this behalf and refer the informant to the magistrate so in the case of a non cognizable offence where the police does not have the power to arrest if it has been committed within the limits of the police station then the officer in charge of the police station will note these things down will note the uh, substance of the information in a book to be kept by such officer and will refer the informant to the magistrate meaning that the officer will not start the investigation on his own no police officer shall investigate a non cognizable case without the order of a magistrate having power to try such case or commit the case for trial so even before starting an investigation the police officer needs an order of the magistrate to start the investigation in the case of a non cognizable offence meaning in other words that in the case of a non cognizable offence it's not just no arrest without warrant but also no investigation without the order of a magistrate so both the things apply here then it further continues any police officer receiving such information may exercise the same powers of investigation except the power to arrest without warrant as an officer in charge of a police station may exercise in a cognizable case so when the order has been received the order from the magistrate so when this order of the magistrate has been received in the case of a non cognizable offence then any police officer receiving such order may exercise the same power in respect of the investigation except the power to arrest without warrant so he may start the investigation once he receives the order but may not arrest without warrant as an officer in charge of a police station may exercise in a cognizable case now where a case relates to two or more offences of which at least one is cognizable the case shall be deemed to be a cognizable case not with standing that the other offences are non cognizable so if the case relates to more than one offence and if one of those offences is a cognizable offence then the whole of the case will be treated as a cognizable case irrespective of the fact that the other offences are non cognizable so even if one of the offences is cognizable the whole case becomes cognizable and in that case the police has the power to arrest without warrant and to start investigation then section 156 says police officers power to investigate cognizable case now so in 155 we were talking about non cognizable cases here we are talking about cognizable cases any officer in charge of a police station may without the order of a magistrate investigate any cognizable case which a court having jurisdiction over the local area within the limits of such station would have the power to inquire into or try under the provisions of chapter 13 so if it is a cognizable case then the police officer in charge of the police station may also start the investigation without the order of a magistrate so cognizable not just means arrest without warrant but also investigation without the order of the magistrate no proceeding of a police officer in any such case shall at any stage be called in question on the ground that the case was one which such officer was not empowered under this section to investigate and any magistrate empowered under section 190 may order such an investigation as above mentioned 
so not just the police officer can investigate but also any magistrate empowered may order the investigation to begin so that is about the uh, cognizable and non cognizable offenses now in this case when we are saying that the police has the power to investigate or not what is investigate so this is defined in section 2h of the crpc investigation includes all the proceedings under this code for the collection of evidence conducted by a police officer or by any person other than a magistrate who is authorized by a magistrate in this behalf so there are two important things one why is invest an investigation done for the collection of evidence and who does it any person other than a magistrate so if a magistrate is doing something it is not investigation it has to be inquiry and investigation is done for the collection of evidence and it includes all the proceedings under this code so what are those proceedings you will have these are the steps proceeding to the spot so that is a part of the investigation that the police officer went to the spot ascertainment of the facts and circumstances of the case so the police officer ascertained if the facts and circumstances are true or not so that is also a part of the investigation finding out whether the things are true or not then discovery and arrest of the suspected of offender this is also a part of the investigation collection of evidence by the processes indicated below or any other lawful means so how do you collect evidence examination of various persons including the accused reduction of the statements of such persons to writing now this part is discretionary and optional because we have seen before that the statements of uh, persons to uh, a police officer they are not admissible as evidence in the court so this is a discretionary and optional step then seizure of things considered necessary we'll look at how searches and seizures are done but seizure is basically taking into position the things that are related to the offense and search of places either to find out people or to find out the things and formation of opinion as to whether on the material collected there is a case to place the accused for trial and if so taking necessary steps for the same by filing of a charge sheet under section 13173 2 of the crpc so all of these are part of the police investigation going to the spot finding out if things are true or not discovering the suspected offender that is finding him out arresting the suspected offender collecting evidence searching taking seizure taking statements examining various persons and then finally forming an opinion as to whether or not on the basis of the material collected there is a case to be placed the accused for trial so all of these are part of a police investigation now when we say uh, filing of a charge sheet here so uh, taking steps for the same by the filing of a charge sheet so let us now look at what this charge sheet is the charge sheet is basically a report of the police officer on completion of the investigation and this is dealt with in section 173 every investigation under this chapter shall be completed without unnecessary delay now uh, subsection 2 says as soon as it is completed the officer in charge of the police station shall forward to a magistrate empowered to take cognizance of the offence on a police report a report in the form prescribed by the state government so once the police has done the investigation the next step is to produce the or to take this case to the court now for taking the case to the court the police will make a report and this report will be sent to the magistrate and on the basis of this report a charge sheet will later come into being so what does this report com- consist of this consists of the names of the parties the nature of the information that they that the police has received or found the names of the persons who appear to be acquainted with the circumstances of the case who knows about the case whether any offense appears to have been committed and if so by whom so 
So has any offense been committed and who has committed this offense? Whether the accused has been arrested or not? Whether he has been released on his bond? And if so, whether with or without sureties? Whether he has been forwarded in custody under section 170? Whether the report of medical examination of the woman has been attached where investigation relates to an offense under section 376, 376A, A, B, B, C, D and so on. The officer shall also communicate in such manner as may be prescribed by the state government the action taken by him to the person, if any, by whom the information relating to the commission of offense was first given. So the police has to report to the magistrate everything about the case, what has been done so far and also about what they have done with regarding to the person who put up this complaint or brought this information. Now where a superior officer of police has been appointed under section 158, the report shall in any case in which the state government by general or special order so directs be submitted through that office. So the state government can direct that the report has to go through a superior officer and he may pending the orders of the magistrate direct the officer in charge of the police station to make further investigation. Now whenever it appears from a report forwarded under this section that the accused has been released on his bond, the magistrate shall make such order for the discharge of such bond or otherwise as he thinks fit. So if the person has been released on a bond, then the magistrate can take further action regarding it. When such report is in respect to a case in which uh, to which section 170 applies, the police officer shall forward to the magistrate along with the report other things like other documents or relevant extracts thereof on which the prosecution proposes to rely other than those already sent to the magistrate during the investigation. So together with the report of the investigation, the police will also send other things that is all documents or relevant extracts of the documents on which the prosecution proposes to rely. The statements recorded under section 161 of all the persons whom the prosecution proposes to examine as its witness. So two things have to be provided, one all the documents that will be relied and all the statements that will be relied during the case. If the police officer is of opinion that any part of any such statement is not relevant to the subject matter of the proceedings or that its disclosure to the accused is not essential in the interest of justice and is inexpedient in the public interest, he shall indicate that part to the, of the statement and append a note requesting the magistrate to exclude that part from the copies to be granted to the accused and stating his reasons for making such a request. So what is happening here? The police is submitting its report to the magistrate and the police is also submitting all the other relevant documents and the statements of witnesses. Now all of these will be given to the accused because uh, in um, a natural justice system, the person has the right to defend himself and one cannot defend himself without knowing what the actual charge is, without knowing what are the evidences against him. So copies of all of these are then given to the accused to make his or her own case. But then the police can note, uh, can put up a note to the magistrate saying that these statements or these portions should not be given to the accused. Why? Because it is either not necessary for the case or it is not expedient in the public interest. So it may damage the public interest. So for example, if there is one document that is, uh, that has some indication about who has filed the report or who provided the information for this. And it is possible that the accused will later on retaliate. So the, the police can then say that, okay, this portion should not be given. And then the magistrate has to take a call. Then subsection 7 says, where the police officer investigating the case finds it convenient so to do, he may furnish to the accused copies of all or any of the documents referred to in subsection 5. So it does not always have to go through the court. The police officer investigating the case may also directly send copies to the accused of all these documents. Now nothing in this section shall be deemed to preclude further investigation in respect of an offence after a report under subsection 2 has been forwarded to the magistrate. So once the police has submitted this report, 
it does not mean that that this the investigation has to stop the police can also do further investigation and where upon such investigation the officer in charge of the police station obtains further evidence oral or documentary he shall forward to the magistrate a further report or reports regarding such evidence in the form prescribed and the provisions of subsections 2 to 6 shall as far as may be apply in relation to such report or reports as they apply in relation to a report forwarded under subsection 2 now in this context the honorable supreme court of india in the state of uttar pradesh versus bhagwant kishor joshi said that investigation in substance means collection of evidence relating to the commission of offense for establishing the accusation against the offender so here in this judgment we can clearly understand why this investigation is done the investigation in substance means that primarily it means collection of evidence relating to the commission of offense so investigation is for the collection of evidence and why do you need to collect this evidence for establishing the accusation against the offender so if the offender has been accused of something so it needs to be established through by means of evidence that yes he or she has done this offense now it is open to a police officer to hold preliminary enquiry for ascertaining the correctness of the information such preliminary enquiry does not amount to collection of evidence and so cannot be regarded as investigation so investigation only begins when the collection of evidence start before that if there is any preliminary enquiry so that is not a part of the investigation so in this context what is an inquiry so section 2g tells about the inquiry so 2g of the crpc says inquiry means every inquiry other than a trial conducted under this court uh, court by a magistrate or a court so this is the legal definition of an inquiry inquiry is any inquiry other than a trial so a trial is not an inquiry conducted under this court by a magistrate or a court now here you'll note that here it says inquiry with an i and in this judgment it is inquiry with an e so this is the difference now in the case of an inquiry that is done by a magistrate or a court we have these points inquiry is never done by police so you'll never find a police inquiry you'll always find a police investigation and a judicial inquiry or a court driven inquiry so inquiry is not done by the police it is done by the magistrate or the court and the trial begins when the inquiry ends so on the basis of the investigation report or even otherwise so the magistrate or the court may also start an inquiry without an investigation being done before and a trial will begin when the inquiry has ended so the object of inquiry is determination of truth or falsehood of certain allegations with a view of taking further action according to law investigation was for the collection of evidence inquiry is for the determination of truth or falsehood of the allegations that is the court has to decide what is the further action to be taken and so for that an inquiry is done to determine whether the things are true or false inquiry may involve examination of witnesses and inspection of the locale so it may involve asking people taking their statements and inspection of the locality where the offense is purported to have been committed and there are several kinds of inquiry you can have a judicial inquiry that is done by a judge a magistrate or the court you can have non judicial or administrative inquiry that is done by administrative officials so for example when we talk about departmental inquiries they come under the category of administrative inquiry then you can have a preliminary inquiry of a preliminary kind you can have a local inquiry in the locality you can have inquiry into an offense or inquiry relating to a matter other than an offense so it is not also necessary that the inquiry should be for an offense it can also be for a matter other than an offense 
So if you look at the differences between investigation and inquiry, investigation is done by a police officer or a person other than a magistrate who is authorized by a magistrate and inquiry is done by a court or by a magistrate. So one is by police or any person and the second one is by a court or a magistrate primarily but it also involves uh, departmental officials in certain cases in, in uh, doing their quasi judicial functions. Then the object of investigation is collection of evidence of inquiry is ascertainment of truth finding out whether it's true or not. Investigation is always non-judicial. Inquiry may be judicial or non-judicial. So as we saw before, inquiry can be judicial done by the judge, court or magistrate, but it can also be non-judicial as in the case of an administrative inquiry. But in investigation, it has to be non-judicial. If it is judicial, it will become an inquiry. Investigation is always about an offence, but in, in, an inquiry may relate to an offence or not. So you can, if you have an offence, then there can be an investigation or an inquiry. But if there is a matter that is not an offence, you will not have an investigation, you can only have an inquiry. Then investigation commences when there are grounds for investigation based on information or otherwise. Inquiry may start on vague rumours with shadowy beginning as per AIR 1968 of the Madras High Court. What it is saying is an investigation can only commence when there are grounds for investigation. So when the police finds out that okay there are certain grounds for investigation only then the investigation will begin based on information that has been received or otherwise. But an inquiry may also start on vague rumours with a shadowy beginning. So in this case the Honourable Court said but it could be said that while an inquiry may start with a shadowy beginning and vague rumours, once a police officer forms a definite opinion that there are grounds for investigating a crime, an investigation under this code has started. Here again you will note that this has the word E. So when you have an inquiry that is being done by the police, it will be it will have the word E and it may start with shadow beginnings and vague rumours. But as soon as it gets based on information or otherwise, it becomes an investigation. So before starting the, the investigation, then the police can do a preliminary inquiry based on any vague rumours with a shadowy beginning, which do not have a concrete evidence. But as soon as you have information, the police will begin an investigation. Next, there are bailable and non-bailable offences. So section 2a defines a bailable offence. Bailable offence means an offence which is shown as bailable in the first schedule or which is made bailable by any other law for the time being in force and non-bailable means any other offence. So what is a bailable offence? It is an offence which is shown as bailable in the first schedule and we saw the first schedule that in this case you have these criteria whether or not offences are bailable or non bailable so a bailable offence is one that the first schedule says is bailable a non bailable offence is one that the first schedule says is non bailable but also other acts can make things bailable or non bailable so bailable means an offence which is shown as bailable in the first schedule or which is made bailable by any other law for the time being in force so if any other act says that this offence will be bailable then it will be bailable and non bailable offence means any other offence which is not bailable. Now bailable offence is an offence where the accused after arrest is entitled to be released on bail as a matter of right. So here bail is a matter of right. In non bailable offence bail is not a matter of right for the accused but it is a matter of discretion for the authority competent to grant bail. So in the case of a non bailable offence bail may be given or not given it is the discretion of the authority and who is the authority to decide that it's either the court or the police officer both of them have this discretion so in the case of a non bailable offence both of them have the power to uh, release the person on a bail now it should not be supposed that bail cannot be granted in a non bailable offence so even in the case of a non bailable offence bail can be granted 
the only important difference is that in a non bailable offense it's not a matter of right it is a discretionary power of the authority that is the court or the police now each application for bail made by an accused in a non bailable offense has to be decided by the competent court or the police authority and how is it decided it is decided on its own merits what is the merit of the case should the offender be given a bail or not due regards being had to the relevant facts and circumstances of the case and bearing in mind the limitation imposed by law if any upon their powers when an accused is granted bail he is released from legal custody upon furnishing a bond with or without surety for his or her attendance at the time and place mentioned therein so what is the purpose of the bail the purpose of the bail is to release the person from the legal custody with a bond that ensures his or her attendance at the time and place that is mentioned which is generally a specified court so in the case of a bail what happens is the person agrees that he or she will attend the proceedings in the court as and when he or she is called so at the time and place where he or she is called the person agrees that i'll come there now what ensures that the person will come it's the bond bond with surety or without so in certain cases the bond will also ask for sureties meaning that a third person should also write that okay if this person does not come then i am ready to give so much amount uh, as deposit in lieu thereof so that is a bond with surety but you can also have bond without surety meaning that the offender himself is a reputable person he has sufficient amount of money so the offender himself will write that okay if i do not uh, comply with the conditions then i will submit this money so that is without a surety now this bond is to ensure the attendance of the offender at the time and place that is mentioned which is generally in front of a court so that is a bail now example writing an offense punishable under section 147 ipc is bailable whereas theft an offense punishable under section 379 ipc is non bailable and we can look at which offense is bailable or not by looking at the first schedule part 1 or part 2 now for any non ipc offense except the position as mentioned in the particular act so if you are not if you are talking about ipc offenses you have to make use of schedule 1 but if it is in a non ipc offense then you have to accept the position mentioned in the particular act if the act says that an offense is bailable then it is bailable if it says it is non bailable then it is non bailable but if the act is silent then referred part 2 of the first schedule of the crpc and we have seen this before the part 2 of the first schedule is classification of offenses against other laws non ipc laws so here also it tells what is bailable and what is not so if punishment is with imprisonment for less than 3 years or with fine only then it is bailable otherwise it is non bailable and typically we will find that the offenses that are not very grave they are made bailable the graver offenses are made non bailable so this is what it says if the act is silent refer part 2 of the first schedule of crpc it is bailable if punishment is with imprisonment for less than 3 years or with fine only otherwise it's non bailable then we have offenses triable as warrant case and offenses triable as summons case and crpc section 2x defines what a warrant case is a warrant case means a case relating to an offense punishable with death imprisonment for life or imprisonment for a term exceeding 2 years so if there is a case relating to an offense that is punishable with imprisonment for a term exceeding 2 years or imprisonment for life or is punishable with death then we'll call it a warrant case and the trial of warrant case is done by chapter 19 which is trial of warrant cases by magistrates so these are graver offenses and section 2w says what is a summons case it means a case relating to an offense and not being a warrant case 
so anything that has an imprisonment of less than or equal to two years or punishable only with a fine those cases are known as summons cases so they are for those offenses that are not very grave and they are dealt with by chapter 20 trial of summons cases by magistrates so depending on the gravity of the case we have different kinds of or different procedures of trials then we have offense exclusively triable by a court of sessions and offense not exclusively triable by a court of sessions. So this is dealt with in section 209. Commitment of case to court of session when offense is triable exclusively by it. So what is happening in this case is here again we are taking the, the graver offenses and the CRPC is saying that these graver offenses will be tried only by a sessions court, not by any of the lower courts. And how will these cases be dealt with? They will be dealt with with the provisions of section 209. Commitment of case to the court of session. That is sending the case to the court of session when the offense is, ex is triable exclusively by it. When in a case instituted on a police report or otherwise, the accused appears or is brought before the magistrate. And it appears to the magistrate that the offense is triable exclusively by the court of session. And how will it appear to the magistrate? Again, the magistrate will make use of the first schedule. So it tells who will be dealing with these cases. Any magistrate, magistrate of the first class or magistrate of the court of session only. So the magistrate will make use of this. And in any case instituted on a police report or otherwise, when the accused appears or is brought before the magistrate, and it appears to the magistrate that the offense is triable exclusively by the court of session, he shall commit after complying with the provisions of section 207 or section 208 as the case may be the case to the court of session. And subject to the provisions of this code uh, relating to bail, remand the accused to custody until such commitment has been made. So when this happens, the magistrate has to send this case to the court of session and remand the accused to the custody till this case is committed to the court of session. Now subject to the provisions of this court relating to bail, remand the accused to custody during and until the conclusion of the trial. Then send to that court the record of the case and the documents and articles if any which are to be produced in evidence. So not only is the case sent but also all the documents and records of the case and the articles they are also sent to the court of sessions and notify the public prosecutor of the commitment of the case to the court of session so the magistrate will also notify the public prosecutor that this case has been committed to the court of session so all these things have to be done if the case is exclusively triable by a court of session then we also have differences between compoundable and non-compoundable offenses Compoundable offenses are those that can be compromised. That is, the complainant can agree to take back the charges levied against the accused. So, as in all cases, you have the complainant and you have the accused. And in certain cases, the complainant can compromise with the accused. And those cases are the compoundable offenses. They can be compromised. So, a compromise can be reached and the complainant can agree to take back the charges levied against the accused. Now primarily these are those cases in which only the complainant is suffering. So these are not those cases where the society is suffering a harm. These are only cases in which the complainant is suffering. The society will also suffer if these things go on and which is why they have been included in the criminal offences. But the offence to the society is very less as compared to the offence against the individual. And so in these cases, there is a provision that the complainant can reach a compromise with the accused and take the case back. And those cases are known as compoundable offences. Non-compoundable offences are the more serious offences in which the parties cannot compromise. So in the case of non-compoundable offences, there is no option to compromise. 
and dealt with by section 320 of the CRPC which defines offences as compoundable without the permission of the court and compoundable with the permission of the court. So, you have three categories. You have compoundable with the permission of the court, compoundable uh, without the permission of the court and non-compoundable offences. So, these are the three categories. So, let us now look at section 320. Now, 320 of the CRPC deals with compounding of offences. The offences punishable under the sections of the IPC specified in the first two columns of the text of the table next following may be compounded by the persons mentioned in the third column of that table. So, it says the offence then section of the IPC which is applicable and person by whom it may be compounded. So, who can compound it? So, for example, the offence of uttering words etc. with deliberate intent to wound the religious feelings of any person. That is dealt with in section 298 of this IPC. So, in this case, the offence is that somebody has uttered some words with deliberate intent to wound the religious feelings of the person. So, this person can then bring up a case against the accused. But then this is a compoundable case, meaning that the person whose religious feelings are intended to be wounded, he may forgive the person, he may agree a compromise and he may take the case back. Voluntarily causing hurt, section 323. So, if an offender has voluntarily caused hurt to a person, the person to whom the hurt is caused may take the case back. So, this is the process of compounding. Voluntarily causing hurt on provocation here as well. The person to whom the hurt is caused may take the case back, may reach a compromise with the offender. Voluntary causing hurt, grievous hurt on grave and sudden provocation, the person to whom the hurt is caused. Wrongfully restraining or confining any person. So, if a person has been wrongfully restrained or confined to a particular room or to a particular building, and so on. So, the person who was restrained or confined may take the case back. Wrongfully confining a person for 3 days or more, section 343, again the person who was confined and so on. So, it is talking about all of those offences which can be compounded. Theft, so if there is a theft, the owner of the property that was stolen can reach a, a compromise and take the case back. So, you may forgive the thief. Dishonest misappropriation of property, the owner of the property misappropriated. Now, in all of these cases, these are offences also against the society. But these are compoundable cases because if the person to whom the maximum amount of injury was caused, the person who was actually hurt, if he is willing to take the case back, then in the interest of public justice, the court says that okay, in these cases, the cases should be allowed to be compounded. Then uh, we also have the second uh, subsection. The offences punishable under the sections of the IPC specified in the first two columns of the table next following may with the permission of the court before which any prosecution for such offence is pending be compounded by the persons mentioned in the third column. So, the subsection 2 is talking again about the offences of the IPC, but it is saying that they can be compounded by these person, but only with the permission of the court, with the permission of the court. In the uh, first subsection, we were not talking about the permission of the court. So, the person, uh, the complainant and the accused could, could reach a settlement and then bring that to the notice of the court. But in these cases, the person cannot reach to a settlement or a compromise without the permission of the court, because these are a bit graver offences. Causing miscarriage, so if a miscarriage or an abortion is caused, then the woman to whom the miscarriage is caused can compound it. So, this person, the, the woman can say that, okay, uh, I, I am ready to take the case back, but she cannot take it back just by herself, the court will give the permission. So, the 
if the court finds that in these cases it should not be compounded even if the woman is agreeing then too if this case was compounded then it will hamper the interests of the society so in those cases the court can say no in the previous case the court has to agree because only the person has the right but here the person together with the court so it is with the permission of the court similarly voluntarily causing grievous hurt under section 325 so the person to whom hurt is caused that person can compound but with the permission of the court because section 325 uh, talks about a grievous hurt which is much greater in magnitude causing hurt by doing an act so rashly and negligently as to endanger human life or the personal safety of others section 337 so in this case there is causing hurt by doing an act so rashly and negligently so the person is not voluntarily causing hurt but is acting in such a rash and negligent manner that he is endangering human life and personal safety of others so in these cases as well the person to whom the hurt is caused may forgive may reach a settlement with the or an agreement with the offender but it has to be with the permission of the court because the court will see if this person is habitually doing actions very rashly and negligently because in those cases if the case is compounded then it will not serve the public interest because this person will go on acting rashly and negligently and then he or she will endanger other people's lives as well so you require the permission of the court now similarly assault or criminal force in attempting wrongfully to confine a person so in this case there are two things involved you have assault and criminal force and why was this assault or criminal force done to wrongfully confine a person so in this case the person assaulted or whom the force was used can compound the case but with the permission of the court because the the court will see if this person is of such a criminal mentality that he or she will again use these criminal forces on other people theft by clerk or servant of property in position of master so if it is a clerk or servant and he or she is doing the theft then the owner of the property stolen can forgive him or reach a settlement but here again it has to go for the permission of the court criminal breach of trust so the owner of the property in respect of which breach of trust has been committed may reach a settlement but because it is a criminal breach of trust it's a graver offense so the permission of the court also is required similarly in the case of cheating and so on so in all of these cases and then it says when an of offense is compoundable under this section the abatement of such offense or an attempt to commit such offense when such attempt is itself an offense or where the accused is liable under section 34 or 149 or the ipc may also be compounded in the like manner so in these cases if the offense is compoundable then the abatement or attempt is also compoundable this is what this subsection is saying now when a, when the person who would otherwise be competent to compound an offense under this section is under the age of 18 years or is an idiot or a lunatic any person competent to contract on his behalf may with the permission of the court compound such offense so if the person is not having the ability because he is under the age of 18 years or is idiot or lunatic then a person who is competing to contract on his behalf may with the permission of the court compound the offense so here again the permission of the court comes in even if it relates to the subsection 1 when the person who would otherwise be competent to compound an offense under this section is dead the legal representative as defined in the code of civil procedure of such person may with the consent of the court compound the offense so what we are observing here is that if the person is not having the ability to compound the cases himself or herself then his or her legal representative or legal guardian has been given the power to compound on his or her behalf provided that the permission of the court is taken so that the person is not taken liberty of so that's about the classification of offenses in the crpc so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind